All right, here we go. My name is Juliana Campfield. I'm the director of Deutsches Haus at NYU, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon, afternoon New York time, afternoon's uh, conversation, um, Herr Kortrup setzt sich hin, conversation with Sharon Dodua or two, which we are absolutely delighted to co-present with Still Magazine today. Um, today is, as many of you know, the um, official International Translation Day. It is also a very strange day, so shortly after the abysmal debate last night, but I think our little event will give this um, day, hopefully, a very, and I'm quite sure it will, a positive note as an antidote to what we saw uh, in politics last night. Not that this event is not about politics, but that's a different story. Let me thank very, very much uh, Brittany Hazelwood, the uh, editorial director of Still Magazine, for this wonderful collaboration. Uh, thank you so much. It, it, I'm so glad we're doing this. I'm so excited about this text and I'm so excited about the translations and having these wonderful people on board to illuminate uh, the text and so much more. Um, thank you Still Magazine. Thank you Zara, my wonderful colleague who's worked very hard with Brittany in making this all happen. And uh, thank you also to our intern Stella Meyer, our project assistant, Adriana Diaz. Thank you to the DAD, the German Academic Exchange Service for their continued support of our academically inclined programs. Um, who else? Um, thank you, the audience, for making time to be here. I know a lot of friends are in the audience. Good to see you. I can't see you, but you can see me, which is weird, but here we go. Um, and thank you, of course, our speakers, uh, Sharon Dodua Otu, Tina Kemd, Katie Derbyshire, and Patrick Ploschnitsky, uh, who will shortly start the discussion of this, this wonderful uh, piece of literature. Um, but before that, I want to very briefly again introduce uh, Brittany. Um, as I mentioned before, she is the editorial director of Still Magazine. She has also been a long, long uh, standing collaborator on Festival Neue Literatur. I can't even remember Brittany when we started working together. It was probably in 1928. <laughs> uh, it's been a while, but, uh, and, uh, and by day she is an intellectual property attorney. Um, that makes you sound like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, but, <laughs> but I think it's working out better than that story. And uh, I think now I've said everything I needed to say, and I think we're, we're ready as, as the, this year's Festival Neue Literatur's motto would have been to turn and face the strange or perhaps to sit down and face the strange. So here you go. Hi, Juliana. Can you, everyone, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Oh, great. Thank you so much for that warm introduction, Juliana. I am besides myself, I'm so happy that this event has come together. And I'm so thankful that Deutsches Haus uh, was willing to sponsor and host this conversation between Sharon, uh, Tina, Patrick, and Katie. Um, and so I have the pleasure today of, of introducing everyone who will be speaking about this publication and issues that evolve from this publication. Um, just by way of background, I thought it could be helpful to speak very quickly about how this um, project came about. Um, I mentioned that, um, or Juliana mentioned that I'm the editorial director of Still Magazine. Um, Still Magazine is an independent small magazine um, and we usually publish inventive writing and photographies in a very large format. We are more of a literary and photography magazine. However, um, in 2016, when uh, Sharon won the uh, Bachmann Prize, um, we had been following it very closely and approached um, Sharon about publishing the book um, as a standalone book for the magazine in 2017. So the book finally came out this year. It was a, a three-year process and Sharon, uh, Sharon, Patrick, Katie, and also Judith Menzel um, were so patient with us in publishing this wonderful collaborative book um, that you see here and which you can order on our website still. Um, and I, I, we just think that it's such an important, important project and an important conversation and an important moment to celebrate Sharon's win at, in the 2016 Bachman Prize. Um, 
And, and generally, I just want to welcome you again to today's conversation. I mean, I think we all know what happened last night and the kind of stories that got uplifted from the conversations last night. And I'm very excited to be a part of a panel um, that celebrates storytelling and also celebrates who can tell stories and who will be celebrated for them. So without further ado, I will introduce um, our panelists. I will start with first our daring moderator, which is uh, Professor Tina Compt. Uh, Professor Tina Compt is the Owen F. Walker Professor of Humanities and Modern Culture and Media at Brown University and a research associate at the Visual Identities and Art and Design Research Center at the University of Johannesburg, South Africa. Professor Compt is a black feminist theorist of visual culture and contemporary art and one of the founding researchers in black European studies. She is the author of three wonderful, wonderful books that I cannot recommend more. Um, the first of which is Other Germans, Black Germans and the Politics of Race, Gender, Memory and the Third Reich, Image Matters, Archive, um, Archive Photography in the African Diaspora and Europe, and finally Listening to Images. Um, and her first forthcoming book, um, A Black Gaze, will be published by MIT um, Press in 2021. And I should also mention that um, Professor Kant was instrumental, if I remember correctly, in a book called Showing Our True Colors, um, uh, uh, um, Faba Buchanan, another book I highly recommend that she has uh, been a part of, and it's just wonderful. Um, the next person I will introduce is uh, our author, um, Sharon Doduo Otu. Um, hopefully she will turn on her camera. There she is. Hi, Sharon. <laughs> so Sharon is an author and political activist. She writes prose and essays and is the editor of the English language book series Witnessed um, with edition Assemblage. In 2017, her first novellas, um, The Thinking I Am Thinking While Smiling Politely and Synchronicity, were published in German translation by S. Fischer Verlag. Um, Sharon won the Ingeborg Bachmann Prize in 2016 with the text Herr Grotschop set zu In 2020, her inaugural speech at the Festival of German Literature, um, it was entitled Dürfen Schwarze Blumen Malen, which I think translates to Can Black Flowers Paint? I, her translators might not agree with me. <laughs> Please chime in. Um, uh, and, and this um, essay will. Um, sorry, was published by the Verlag Hayen, and her first novel in German will appear in 2021 and will be published with S. Fischer as well. Um, Sharon is politically active with the Initiativa Schwarze Menschen in Deutschland and Phoenix AV, um, a, yeah, AV and she lives in Berlin um, with her family. Thank you, Sharon, so much for being here and Tina as well. Um, next, I will introduce one of Sharon's translators into the British English, which is Katie Derbyshire. There's Katie. Uh, Katie Derbyshire translates contemporary German writers, including Heike Geisler, Olga Grzhnova, and Clemens Meyer. She co-hosts a monthly translation lab in Berlin and the bi-monthly live Dead Lady Show, which has its own podcast. Katie is now publisher at V&Q Books, um, which, ex exported, which exports remarkable writing from Germany to the UK and Ireland. Thank you so much for being here, Katie. And finally, and we have Patrick Plushnitsky. Okay. Patrick is a PhD candidate in transcultural German studies with a minor in translation studies at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Among his literary translation publications are Jürgen Bauer's Das Fenster zur Welt in translation review and selected poetry and short stories by Zafar Zanoka, Zanosha. Is that right, Patrick? Close? Okay. <laughs> He's currently working on a translation into German of Aaron Com Kometbus's Postmortem, a journalistic investigation of what's left of the 1990s California punk scene. Patrick's disserta dissertation research investigates amateur online commentary on US American television dubbed into German. Other research interests include the use of online translation tools in foreign language classroom, as well as redefined Redefine Heimat imagery and contemporary, contemporary punk and rap lyrics. Um, so again, thank you all so much for joining. You guys are in for a really wonderful conversation and I will be going away now. 
Hi, Brittany, and thank you so much for the wonderful introductions. Um, I also have to, to begin by thanking Sara and Juliana for inviting me to be part of this discussion, for making this discussion happen. Um, I also have to thank Sharon for <laughs> your brilliant story, and Patrick and Katie for all the work you did in bringing this story alive in in a different language to a broader and bring it to a broader audience. Um, I also have to apologize in, in advance because I have, as I've told the other participants, I have a dog that likes to be present on Zoom. So if you hear barking and if I suddenly mute myself, that's because Mildred, which is her name, uh, wants to be part of this conversation. Um, so that's my apology in advance for Mildred's desire to participate. <laughs> So um, I, I have to confess that I got really excited when um, this invitation was extended and when I got to read um, uh, the publication um, in its beautiful form because it did this thing which you know very few pieces of literature can do, which is it took me back into a feeling of being in Germany. Um, and I think that's where I want to start. Um, I want to start with the challenge of um, being able to articulate a feeling um, that you do so beautifully in this story, um, Sharon. And, and being able to transmit the, a feeling of Deutsch signs, <laughs> right? Or a feeling of a German context, a very, very specific German context that you do in more or less one scene, you know, <laughs> which is Am Frühstückstisch, right? Frühstückstisch is this really particular German feeling <laughs> that you're able to, to communicate to us. And for me, the way in which you do it challenges us to think about what the difference is between mother tongue, Muttersprache, or foreign language, Fremdsprache. Um, and it's something that you do um, both within the, the story itself, but I have to say, you also do it in the title <laughs> by putting yes. it, in, by calling him an unpronounceable name. <laughs> the bit that I was happiest about of all that so many people can't pronounce the name I love that <laughs> well, well, that's it's yeah. Great. yeah so so I guess I want to hear you talk about that about how as um a black Britain living in Germany right mm. how you are able to translate feeling in this text both through the setting as well as through your choice of language in your quote unquote second language, because I want to keep that in brackets. <laughs> yeah, okay. Oh, wow, well, it's a great question. Thank you very much for the invitation and the organization. And thank you, Tina, for <laughs> agreeing to moderate. I'm very happy about that. Um, being able to um, grasp the essence of an emotion or a feeling and uh, transport that to a reader is actually my, my goal. When I write, um, that's exactly what I'm trying to do. So it's really great to hear that it worked. And it's really fascinating when um, I read this story um, in Germany and then so many people afterwards come up and say, oh, I feel transported back to my parents' house. And oh my God, how did you know? <laughs> um, I guess what I tried to do was to observe the small things, just the little details. And um, I also really enjoyed, there was um, an inversion. Um, what we know as people of color and black people and um, migrants is that we are the ones that are asked all the questions and, and our identity is kind of picked apart. You know, where do you come from and how long have you been speaking German or what have you? And what I did in the story was I tried to pack all those tiny details into the, the white character, mm -hmm. the white male character. So we know exactly how tall he is. We know exactly how old he is. It's all there. And then the character that's, that's the one that's the least well described, the one we know the least about is um, the figure of Ada or Ada, 
um, who's the only thing we know about her is that her German's much better now. That's pretty much it. So that was one thing that I deliberately did was uh, to invert that. And also the choice of the name, it was really a very um, weird thing that I did. I started to write, when I first started to write, I wanted to write stories with black women as the main characters. That was my political aim. I was fed up of only reading stories where um, there were characters who I, I grew to love, but I just didn't feel like they shared every single part of the um, experience of the world that I also shared. And I wanted to read stories of people like me and Toni Morrison famously said, then you have to write your own. <laughs> and so I did that. And then I said, but if I ever write a story about a white German guy, he'll be called Helmut. <laughs> that was because there's this really wonderful film called Night on Earth. And in this film, Night on Earth, there's a character called Helmut. I don't know if anyone re remembers this film and this, this funny little character who drives a taxi, but he can't really drive, so it keeps on jerking. And he wears a funny hat. And it's such a great character. And I said, I would, I would always um, choose that name if I was ever going to write this character. So I started to write this character, Helmut. And one day while I was writing, I decided to Google some Helmuts to see what kind of surname I could come up with. And there was Helmut Schmidt and Helmut Kohl, and I found them, you know, there's not enough there for an imaginative story to come out. But I did come across this name, Grötrup, which I can barely pronounce myself. I oh, love thank it. You. It has this umlaut, <laughs> it has this R, Gr, has the double P, it's all in there, right? <laughs> and, and I just chose the name, it won, if you like. And then much later, I, I learned a little bit more about this fascinating figure. He was a real historical figure, uh, born in 1916, lived in Nazi Germany. He was a rocket scientist. He was involved in creating um, the V2, worked with Bernhard von Braun. And I just found it fascinating that Bernhard von Braun went to the States and made this great shiny career. And um, Helmut Grötrup went um, to Russia and kind of sank into oblivion. I mean, he did a lot of, you know, he, he designed the chip card, the when we pay by card for things, that was his invention, but we barely know this. And I just found that really fascinating. So that's really where the story took off. Wow. So <laughs> I, I love what you were saying about um, one of the ways that you can communicate a f the feeling of a setting or a scene is through observation. Um, because, you know, I remember that really vividly of being in Germany and one of the things that one takes in, one is, it's micro observant, <laughs> right? Um, and to be able to then um, articulate those things is also really fascinating. And I'm so glad you brought up Ada. <laughs> I'm so glad you brought up Ada because that is also another incredibly revealing um, exchange that you know the exchange where du hast damit angefangen right with the dutzen right that he forgets himself and he forgets all of the things that he represents in terms of german formality and is struck by you know he begins to dutzen um and she when he in, when he corrects her she tells him that he started but also at the same time you know he's talking down to her right when he begins yeah. to dutzen right yeah. Um, yeah, and that you're able to give that, bring that tension out. I mean, that's also this wonderfully imp like precise use of German language to communicate feelings. Yes. And sometimes I'm asked about whether I could have written this story in English, and it's be precisely because of those things that I think I couldn't have. And if I was, if I was to write a similar story, um, I would have to use completely different images. Like, for example, I don't know if Patrick was there when um, I was touring in the States and doing the reading in English uh, or the English translation. Someone mentioned to me that in the United States context, they wouldn't be fighting about how long an egg gets boiled. They'd be fighting about how long you brew the coffee or how strong the coffee should be or something like this. And in, in the UK, it would be something complete. Maybe it'd be the tea, Katie. What do you think? I don't know. But <laughs> it would be something completely different. So, yeah, I would have found this story actually impossible to write in English, which is why I'm really, really grateful for the translations. And look at me, not just one, but two. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Well, you actually, well, this is a really great 
place to bring in Katie and Patrick um, because you know the challenge of trans of writing feeling you know, <laughs> gets doubly enhanced in translating that and translating it backwards or inverted translation because that's what I'm calling it when uh, a writer writes in her second language and others translate it back into her first language right so for me that was terrifying. <laughs> the idea that I am act, I would be translating something for somebody who knows that language as well or better than me because they know the intentions behind that. Um, so I want to talk to you about some of what that looked like. Um, and specifically, what kind of dialogues did you have? And, and it's, it's, a, it's a loaded question because I had the, the distinct honor and pleasure many, many years ago of translating Maya Yim's poetry into English for her, her readings, um, some of them, some of her poets. And my experience of that was literally sitting next to her. <laughs> you know, I would do a draft, she would read it out loud and say what worked and what didn't work. And then my job was to go back and sort of like literally take my entire vocabulary and say, well, there's this word and then there's this word and there's this word, right? And it's, it's poetry. So it's not even about the meaning. It's also about the, the melody of it, the lyricality of it. So, I, so you're in this doubly complicated position of that sort of inverted translation and at the same time competing versions of English translation. Right, so there's this like incredible triangle that I think is actually made manifest in the book itself, and I want to talk about that later. But I want to ask you to 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 share a bit about what it was, what your process was to enter that triangle and to produce a kind of triangulated um, translation. Who wants us to have addressed both of you? Who wants to go first? <laughs> okay. I can start. I can start. I, I just thank you, Tina. First of all, oh, I'm impre so impressed that you've uh, translated it to my IE. Thank you. Um, uh, and, and the second thing I want to say is, is I didn't, I didn't, when I was translating, perceive my work as in competition. Mm. Maybe I didn't know that Patrick and you were working on it. I don't know. <laughs> um, um, I think you didn't know at first. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, but but at this, but nevertheless, um, the literary translation world is is inc incredibly supportive mutually, and and I very rarely feel like I'm in competition with with other translators. Maybe it's just because we're such marvelous people. I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, and yes, I think I wrote a little about a little bit about in my in my translators note that it was terrifying to be going into this translation. I don't think we knew each other really, did we? I think we've maybe spoken. No, maybe we hadn't spoken. We just emailed. Um, and it's always uh, it's always frightening what a writer is going to think of of my work because they know their work so intimately, and they're reading my interpretation of it which is going to be different to everybody else's interpretation of it um but it was particularly trans uh, particularly terrifying with with, with Sharon <laughs> 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 for that very reason do you know that you said you know so um uh yeah I just I think I just like bit the bullet um and and then we uh I, I translated the whole thing and there were a couple of questions we met up and went through it together sitting down in this cafe yeah we cleared a couple of things up it yeah, was fine yeah, small yeah. Thing. it was actually then I was very relieved I think I got very nervous when I got there and then left very very happy <laughs> <laughs> Patrick how was it for you um, yeah, just to uh, go back to um, a question that you asked before, like about how it, what it's like, or what it feels like if, if you're translating into something that's that's not your your native language or your first language. Um, I always use this metaphor of walking on very thin ice, where I feel like I'm just kind of like making my way, you know, across like a frozen lake or something like that, and like but I could crash in any second. Um, 
because um, yeah, it's always kind of an approximation for me almost because I, I have to look up a lot of the words even though if I can like come up with one possible translation right off the bat. But of course I want to make sure that like of all the things or that I'm aware of all the potential translations that are out there, which might not be on my radar. Um, and yeah, something that, that really plays into that really well is, is being in close contact with your author, which, you know, Sharon was amazing about. Um, and I've had this, this experience luckily with other authors too. Um, yeah, where you can also just really get into the, the nitty gritty. But at the same time, it's like you're saying, Katie, it's also terrifying, <laughs> you know, because here I am like this, this German guy who, you know, knows some English, who is trying to explain to this, again, native speaker, their language and th something that they wrote uh, too, like it's, it's almost double. Uh, yeah, it can be really terrifying. But um, in my experience, I feel it's always been like a really great and fruitful process. Um, and I feel, especially in, in this particular project, we also had like the additional layer of, you know, uh, British English versus American English. So, you know, I come into like mostly American English, I would say, because that's the, the kind of um, environment that I mostly fostered my English in. So I don't know a lot of um, vocabulary, for example, when, when it comes to, to British English, but also nuances, especially like cultural nuances, the things that you really have to like experience by living in the speech community, you know, uh, and to, to realize, oh, this is maybe a word someone would choose if they want to make a particular statement about something or something like that. Um, I think that's really fascinating. I, there's, a, there's a couple of questions in the Q&A and I'm, I'm not, I am going to save some time to do that, but there's something that's really on point that, they've, that two people have posed, one person actually, um, which is, um, I'll just read them. On the triangle of inverted translation, who gets to have the last word on what goes on the translated version, the translator or the author? And then a follow-up question, is the translator also becoming a kind of secondary author or even a co-author? Mm. Um, I think it's a really interesting question mm. to think about, you know, it's not simply a service, right? You're not, mm. it's not an automated kind of thing. There is an interpretive dimension to it. And I've always thought that that's a really important um, aspect to bring out and also one of trust between an author and a translator that that those interpretive moments um, are acknowledged and embraced or you know it, you have to work through them um, I mean Katie you said it was sort of like relief that yeah. <laughs> that that um, that your co-authorship was accepted right with some with some changes right and at the same time you know, still thinking of that as a triangulated process. So interesting. It is because it is, it was more complicated than usual because of that triangulation of, of Sharon being a native English speaker and, and our English is being very, very close. I mean, we come from opposite sides of London, but that's still quite close. Um, yeah. um, because usually I would say the translator has the last word. Yeah. Um, and here it wasn't, or I, I, we didn't, I don't remember any conflicts, but it, it was, uh, yeah. I think we, we found, maybe because our English is so, are so close, we found kind of mutually compatible solutions, yeah. So for me, for me it was very, the way I see it is um, the translations I don't, I don't feel like a co-author of the translation. I might be a, a consultant maybe, but uh, <laughs> I think it's Katie's work and Patrick and Judith's work. And I don't know whether you want to show some of the slides, Patrick, to show the conversations we had, but in my memory for both of you, when I read your versions, I might have said, oh, that word I would probably use, or that's what I meant actually, but it's for me very clear that it's, like you said, Katie, it's your interpretation. You've read the text, it did something with you and that's what you put on paper. And that's the way I felt for both versions. I remember that um, you chose some US American words 
And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and she wears trousers. But then I thought about it again, and I thought, well, in the US, when people read that text, they're going to have to try to, you know, quickly associate something with the words on the page. And so who am I to say, no, that's the wrong word? It, I didn't, I felt that that was the translator's decision, and I feel comfortable with letting go, actually, of that. Can I ask you about that? Because that's something that I've, that was really striking to me. The decision to have two English translations. Um, and was it an intentional, I want a British <laughs> translation, I want an American translation. Um, and, and so why? <laughs> because, you know, as an English yeah. speaker, I was trying to sort of try and decide what is the difference between the two. And oddly, they didn't feel like one was British and one was, was American. Oh. It felt like there was a certain moment of formality, certain kinds of formality, and certain kinds of le informality, but it swapped out between mm -hmm. the two. Okay. And so I wanted, I really want to hear why two, two English translations and what the distinctions were. I have forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> I really have, because, you know, it happened at that time when I won the prize, there was this whirlwind of, you know, press and all of a sudden I was in a completely different space in terms of my career. And I, I was in touch with uh, David, right? David Gramling, who maybe is online. Hello, David. Um, I was in touch with David um, over Twitter, um, who has said to me, is there an English translation of your story? And if not, can we translate it? And I said, go right ahead. But I think you were already translating, Katie. I think, okay. or you might have done it already, or I don't know, but you contacted me at, I, in my memory, you contacted me at some point and said you had this translation and I didn't know about it when I said to them they could do theirs. I, I don't remember it that well. I would have to uh, do some research in my emails. But it was, there was a moment of stress for me when I thought, oh, I have to tell them both. I hope they won't be upset. But um, then you know, I had this feeling that yes, definitely there will be two different interpretations, and especially because Katie is from the UK and the other team were from the US, I thought it wasn't at all um, a doubling. It didn't feel like a double thing. It felt like there were two unique translations, which will be both important for me. Mm -hmm. Patrick, can you say a little bit about, you know, how your process in, as well in this particular I mean, because but Katie was talking about a particular kind of relationship to British English that she shared with Sharon, and your experience is very, very different. Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, again, as like a non-native speaker, but also, of course, I did not do this work by myself. Um, I have a co-translator, uh, Judith Minzel, who unfortunately can't, uh, couldn't make it today. Um, but so basically what we did is that we like very pragmatically separated the text, like almost split it in, in half, in, not, not in the sentence, but you know, at the end of the, um, the paragraph. Um, and I would translate the first half, she would translate the second half, and then we kind of switch and edit each other's work. Um, so that, that's what we did. So um, it's, it's first of all, the, like the linguistic level, I would say, um, of, you know, doing this in, uh, yeah, in, in American English. Um, but also uh, because Judith and I both, um, yeah, have, have a different linguistic background, but her um, experience is more, uh, well, she, she learned her English growing up in, in the United States, whereas I learned mine later. So um, it was just a good compliment, is what I'm trying to say. Like we, I would say like our linguistic skills complemented each other really well. Uh, especially when we started editing each other. Um, but then, of course, uh, the work that, that we had uh, put together, um, we, we sent to Sharon. And that led to like, like a whole different conversation um, that you like, briefly touched on already. Um, yeah, because we were using these Americanisms. You know, we, we used the, what, what do we have? Um, Hot. The the pants, the pants versus trousers, for example. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of my favorites, I think, was um, where we um, were talking about 
uh, going down to, to the store to get more eggs and she couldn't. Um, and I said something like um, that there was no time left to go to go grocery shopping. And you, um, Sharon said something like she, she's popping down to the shops. Yeah. Um, which, first of all, I had never heard before. <laughs> <laughs> and just sounded so very British to me. Um, and that also led to a moment where, where I just kind of pointed it out. I was like, oh, I'm not sure if, if like an American reader, you know, without a British background, if, if this is something where they, where they would like, you know, like, huh? Like, what? Like, what? Yeah. Um, and just be like a little puzzled. Um, and then I think sharing you, your response was just, oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, which is also maybe a good way to illustrate uh, the the relationship you know of um, like working with with your author and then um, having them as a great resource obviously um, which is also very important uh, because it's, it's not necessarily always a, a um, like a lexical issue but it can also be something um, that you know Sharon meant as like an undertone that I just didn't mm -hmm. read or that read differently, for example. And then it's great to have an author who's like, oh, actually, you know, like uh, he's a little annoyed already in, in mm -hmm. this moment or something like that, which maybe went over my head. I'm, I'm not sure if that answers your question. That does. I mean, I, it actually raises a question for me, a really specific question for me, and I hadn't anticipated this, but now I'm going to share my screen. <laughs> <laughs> about oh I I I I'm gonna ask Juliana or um, or Sarah could you allow me to share my screen really quickly? Can you? Ah, I can. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to share. Oh, here we go. Can you see what I see? Yep. Yes. Okay. Yay, Minch. <laughs> <laughs> That is a term that to me, um, it actually kind of goes back to another question I had, but it, it breaks in here too, which is your use or your creation <laughs> of, of the term ye mensch. And yeah. it's a kind of ownership of German um, that I love. And that to me also um, connects you to a broader um, what I call, what I would describe as a, a Black German literary tradition, right? Mm -hmm. um, of what does it mean to take ownership of German in ways that use it to, you know, to really Sachen auf den Punkt bringen in that way. And so I, I immediately also thought of my text, Leberwurst Grau, you know, where she's actually sort of playing on the German terms to actually say something about German exclusion. And yeah. so I was really struck by that here. And I was also struck by the limits of translating it. And it, it really goes to the point that Patrick and Ka Katie were making about how do we, you know, what are the limits of translation? And I kept trying to think, how would I translate this other than someone, right? But it's yeah. someone with, a, with an intentional, um, uh, set of values. So I, I wanted to hear Sharon talk about that term, her use of that term, as well as the challenges or the limits of translating that from Katie and, and Patrick. Sure, I can talk about that. That's a brilliant example of how I really wasn't at all in the literature context or the mainstream literature context in Germany. Um, and I did not write this story for um, the Ingeborg Bachmann Prize, and I didn't write it. I, I was super surprised um, that anybody else read it outside of my friendship group. Let's put it that way. <laughs> That's one of the words that proves it because um, at that time when I wrote the story, I think I wrote the story around 2013, 2014. I was very, very uh, active in Black German context, as you said, and I was also active in queer feminist context. I think I was even blogging with Mädchenmannschaft at the time. Mm -hmm. And Yemensch was a word that they used all the time. Mm -hmm. And so I was I was reading it and discussing it. And Yemensch, just to quickly explain, um, is 
is a way of saying somebody, but the German word jemand has the word man in it and it mm -hmm. feels masculine. In my head now, it feels masculine. Mm -hmm. And so jemensch is a way to avoid this masculinity and to make a space for uh, other gender identities or more gender identities. So I use jemensch and it was important to me to use jemensch at that point in the text as well, because I was talking about Herr Grotrup, who'd never heard, he probably would never have heard of this word jemensch and would definitely not identify with it. And I also used the word cis man. That was also a deliberate move. I didn't think that he would know what a cis man was and that's what the text says. And I also deliberately don't explain what it is at any point in the text. For that reason, <laughs> somebody mm -hmm. once said, if you have to ask what a cis man is, then you probably are one. <laughs> 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 um, but my point was to show that like he's actually this figure who, who has so much knowledge and so much expertise and he knows everything and he's sure in his routine. And then there's this perspective that's showing him, actually, no, there are limits to your knowledge and there are other perspectives that would look at you in a different way and put you in an other light and use different vocabulary to describe you that you wouldn't use yourself. Mm -hmm. So that was why I used this word, image. Mm. And Katie and Patrick, in encountering that word, <laughs> I mean, that's like, you know, so how do you communicate that? I mean, because that is, that is one of those, um, Kleinfühligkeiten, <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> that this, this little sensitivities that, you know, everything that you said comes through, Sharon, when reading it in German, yeah. but I don't know how to capture it in English. And maybe that's one of the examples that, that you were referring to about like yeah. why you didn't translate it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can see in the, the paragraph below on the screen, that's mine, and the bottom one is Patrick and Judith, that, uh, yeah, I've gone for any, anyone, and Patrick and Judith have uh, somebody, maybe they can address that, I, mean, I think somebody might be nicer, might maybe a better solution because it has a body in it. Um, mm. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. Mm thinking about it now I would want to possibly look for similar words that, that have a similar hidden man in them in English mm -hmm. which I think is I think English has found ways to yeah. do with that better already yeah. than German <laughs> which is still working on that yes I agree. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, so I'm not, it's just not there in, in my version. Mm. Patrick, what about you? Yeah, um, I mean, from what I understand, this is also the kind of thing that just gets edited out a lot mm -hmm. um, when there really would be an opportunity to, you know, uh, use gender nonconforming uh, language or, or inclusive language. Um, and that's kind of what we went for, I think, because we were like, hmm, okay, so this really stands out in the German, but in English, we kind of already have they for that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, and I think that that's why we try to use they as much, because also, um, I mean, not everybody here uses it either. You know, like I've had some days edited out of term papers, for example, you know, yeah. or, or marked. Um, and it's, it can be new for some people. So that's uh, why at least I didn't want to have a he in there or, or something like that. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of why we went with they because that has maybe a similar history behind it, but it's just not as obvious as a neologism like that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going to try and stop sharing my screen, but that might be challenging. <laughs> I can't Say goodbye already, just in case. <laughs> Okay. Um, I don't know how to stop sharing my screen. Ah, there it stopped. Thank you. <laughs> but this is getting so incredibly fascinating. I have just a couple more questions and then I want to switch over to answering or posing some of the questions from uh, the audience who are already very, very engaged. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I actually want to switch now to 
the final outcome, you know, sort of when your work goes from being um, a text that you have edited or created and that you're talking to each other about to um, something like this, which is kind of a design masterpiece. <laughs> and and did you did you have input in terms of, I mean, this is to all three of you in terms of what it would look like um, and are you happy with? I mean, what is what does it feel like to see all of these different, to see them in conversation? Because the design literally physically puts each version in conversation with the other. Um, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on that and your thoughts about something else that everybody also um, who will read it. I mean, I had that experience, which is how do you read it? <laughs> do you read it horizontally? Do you read it vertically? Do you read it circularly? <laughs> you know? So I just love to hear you ask us or talk about that in terms of like moving from your composition of it, your interpretation mm -hmm. of it, to something that's in the world where readers are trying to grapple with it. Well, one thing was, it, there was a nice long period of time, right, where we had been uh, in conversation, was it three years? We had been in conversation about this publication and then there was the, the stories, um, there was a process of editing those, um, proofreading them. Then there were the, uh, there was an interview with me and the translator's notes. Um, and then Brittany's uh, editorial, and it all came together piece by piece in my memory. There were different things that came together at different times. I remember the first time I saw the cover, um, and oh, there are these really brilliant um, illustrations. And you'll find an example of like this dog. I can't find the dog, but there's these really beautiful illustrations. Oh, yeah, there's the dog. Thank you, Kate. It's on the back. The back of Daphne. Oh, of course, yes. <laughs> the back of Daphne. Um, and I remember seeing that and thinking, wow, like that's for me another translation, right? To do it visually as well. I was totally blown away. And the idea of putting them on the page together, again, um, in, in conversation with each other, I love that idea very, very much. But yeah, if we're going for full confession, I haven't read it, like, <laughs> I read it but I haven't read the book. <laughs> I can't do that, that's gonna stress me, I have to admit, that would, that, that's too hard. But I really love reading the other texts, the, the interviews and the translator's notes and, and then. Patrick? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, when I got it first, or when I saw it first, I, I think I started reading it like like crisscross, or just kind of like tic tac toeing or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, just like jumping from box to box and comparing, and um, yeah, and I think that's also one of the, the uh, wonderful things about this amazing design um, is that you can, like, it's not linear really, but to to a certain extent only. Um, and you can just also go through and just read the German, you know, or just read one of the translations. Um, but it kind of gives you a little bit of um, control almost, I'm going to say, mm. um, how you read it. Katie? I'm just going to make you even more envious, Tina, and tell you how it, it feels really nice. It's really <laughs> lovely feeling. Oh, Tina. Um, uh, and one of the, the, the fun part of that is I was rereading it yesterday to, to kind of prepare, refresh my memory. Because you're not, if you're reading just one part, so I was some, sometimes I was reading yours, yours and Judith's part, Patrick, uh, and, and you flick the pages really often because it's not that much, you know, because I'm just reading this bit. So you're flicking them really often. It feels like reading a children's book almost. Mm -hmm. You're turning mm -hmm. the page so often. And then it has these beautiful uh, illustrations, which again, we don't have with a lot of adult fiction, you know, so. so uh, right. uh, and and uh, I really like the type. Um, yeah. Uh, it, speaking as a, as a, like a brand newly minted publisher, uh, I had I never used to think about these things, you know, and now I'm having to read like, oh, what kind of paper do we choose for the but no, I don't actually choose that thing. But um uh, 
all these kind of physical uh, considerations that you don't, you're not normally involved with in as a translator, and and you know you, you get the book in the end, and and often enough it is not a thing of beauty, and this re this really is. So I'm very pleased. Yeah. I mean, I also feel like um, the irony of this particular edition of it is that it kind of throws into a different, it does a different thing with that first paragraph, right? Mm -hmm. The instructions, and I'll just read it. Please ensure you're sitting comfortably. You should be neither too hot nor too cold. Feel free to scratch your left elbow should you feel the need. If you have a cough or a sneeze, now would be the appropriate time. You should be holding the printed story in your right hand, slowly raise your left hand and hold it over your left eye you may now start reading. That, you know, was to begin with, <laughs> you know, in, just in German, that was already complicated. But yes. now when you have three different texts, I mean, I literally tried to do it <laughs> because, I, because I'm, you know, I'm like that. I like to try and follow instructions, but it's also, it's also, you know, reading it in German, it really does play on this sort of myth of obedience. Yeah. Right? Um, but again, you're putting the reader in a position where it is actually impossible to read like that in this particular version. So I, I mm -hmm. kept thinking about how it amplified some of the things from the original text that you were doing to your reader of unsettling them, making yeah. them uncomfortable, making them try to make some choices. Oh God, sorry. <laughs> Try to make some choices. Um, so yeah, so I, I would love to hear you reflect on that because I'm sure that wasn't intentional, but it's now unavoidable. It's impossible to do, you see. I should have read it, then I wouldn't have. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a lot of, the original story was um, like this, like, you know, and you, you could easily do it, or relatively easily. Um, and that was um, edited to fit the format of the competition, um, the Ingeborg Buckman Prize competition, where right at the beginning of the uh, reading, um, copies of the story are handed out to the audience. So I knew that this was going to happen. So I edited the text so that, you know, hold the, this printed copy of the story in your right hand. And what I really enjoy <clears throat> I'm so cruel like that, <laughs> watching, people, watching people be all confused because they don't know whether to do it or not. And I really like that moment. And I like, I like that, um, I think people often feel that they can just consume, right, a, a piece mm -hmm. of paper. They can just, you know, they can take a informed distance and, you know, look at it and say, hmm, yes, it was nice, but it had nothing to do with me. And I wanted to write something which would straight away with the first sentence say, no, no, you've got to get involved. You've got to make a decision, you know. Yeah, so I'm so excited. And I guess one thing that is a, is a lot of fun having these, um, having the three all side by side, um, and I'm really grateful for, is I think it highlights just how difficult the job of a translator is. You can really see, like, to come up with an interpretation of this, it can look like this or like this. I think it's a real, I can't think of the English, what's verdigo? <laughs> a verdigo de Arbeit. Pardon? What, verdigo? Yeah, verdigo de Arbeit. I can't oh, think oh, of Oh, yes, it. it's... Um... Appreciation. Yes, yes. It doesn't sound as good as vertigo in my no, opinion. No, no. Value. It's a valuing of it. Value. I like value. Okay. Yeah, that's that's brilliant, I think. It really it really shows what, what that work because when I when I first won the prize, um, my family back in the UK had no idea, right? They was like, oh, Sharon won a prize. Great, great. What was it she did again? She wrote a short story. <laughs> so, of course, one of the things they said was, oh, you know, translate it. Translate it like that, you know, in five minutes or something. I was like, there's no way you're going to get a translation out of me. You're just going to have to take my word for it. I wrote a story about a guy who argued with his wife about an egg, and I won, right? And so when this appeared, I was so grateful because... People like my family who don't speak German and my siblings don't even, they don't speak a second language. So they don't have a concept of what it means to try to translate. Um, 
this can this makes it very very um, tangible what translation means what what language is what language can do and what the work of translation translators is so i'm super grateful that i yeah that my story has the honor of being in this edition to show that terrific yeah I think I want to sort of open up for some questions. And so I encourage any of the, um, anyone in the audience to add your questions to the Q and A um, thread. And I'll just start with a couple that I'm seeing right now. Um, <laughs> um, one of them is, I have a question about one of the trickier words in the story, which is wackel <laughs> uh, <laughs> Is there a British term for, and, and, and we have one, there's an American term, which is bobblehead. Is there a British term for that? So that's one of the questions. Yeah, I'm gonna just ask that because this is a cultural phenomenon that they cannot, a cultural phenomenon that the British actually share with the Germans and we call it a nodding dog. <laughs> and it has, I would say, quite similar kind of cultural connotations. You know, the older drivers will have it on the back of their car. I don't know what, I don't really do cars, but you know that bit. Yes. We'll kind of ride yes. along <laughs> at the back of the car, nodding its head, you know, so, so it's a nodding dog. And, and instantly, I think, I don't know if you'll agree, Sharon, but it instantly conjures up that sort of 1970s um, dullness. Yeah. Isn't it in an advert? There's a, there's yeah. a car advert, Churchill's or something. I don't Insurance, know. Insurance, yeah. Like yeah. That. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so bizarrely. I, so yeah. I, so I understand that. Am I right? That Americans are not familiar with this thing? We not have, we don't have, it's less the dogs that we have. Oh. Um, it's more, it's, we have all sorts of different things that can be bobbleheads. And so yeah, there, it's like, you know, so there can be a bobblehead Trump. You know, it's just, it's just one of these things. It's any kind of figure that they put. Oh. Um, so. Uh, it's just yeah. got images in her head. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm gonna give you another question. Um, and this one goes to Sharon. Do mm -hmm. you have another project or book in the works? Mm -hmm. I've heard that there might be an extension of Herr Gottrup um, Zetzichin. And if so, how will this process be different? How will the process be different? Um, okay, I do have another project that's nearly killed me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been writing the novel, which is inspired by this short story. I've been writing that for the for the last four years, and I'm almost done. And um, unfortunately, Herr Grotter isn't in the story. I'm very sorry, everybody. <laughs> the story is mostly based on um, the figure of Ada or Ada. Mm, great. Yeah. I love, that. I love that. And it's due to be published in German uh, at the end of February next year. Congratulations. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. you. Yeah. Yeah. What a gorgeous cover, if I may say so. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here's another question. I'm wondering about Sharon's choice of the I as a character in the story. Yeah. I being a homonym for English, for the English I as the first yes. person. I'm wondering if that was an additional layer of meaning when Sharon chose the I. The German I also sounds like the English I, which I find interesting in terms of the I seeming to be an all-seeing I. That could be a poem itself. That's so wonderful. <laughs> I would really love at this point to say, yes, of course, that was a very artistic choice of mine. And um, I'm very glad that everybody understood the reference I was making. Mm. But actually, no. <laughs> I was um, I was writing the breakfast scene, um, and we got to the conflict with the egg, which I found out now, of course, isn't an original conflict. Laurie all did it before me, but I didn't know that at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, we had this conflict with the egg, and I didn't know how to end the scene. I couldn't work out. In my mind, um, it was a conflict between man and wife, <laughs> husband and wife. And I wanted wife to win, but I couldn't work out how she did. 
So I slept on it a couple of days and then the solution I came up with was that the egg would speak. It's a bit of a wild solution, but that's how it happened really. And then I wrote a, a lot of text about um, this being that happens to be an egg on that particular morning. And then after, <laughs> after the story got awarded this prize, I read some really wonderful reviews. And one of them was this excellent discussion about the, the egg being I as a German word, but the I sounds like I, ich, and yeah, all the things you've just said. And I was blown, I was like, wow, what a great story. <laughs> so yeah, sometimes um, I think also just strike lucky, I guess, that they, they do something and it resonates. It has the right context and the right readers to take the idea and run with it. There's another wonderful question here um, that I think uh, we could think about. Have any of you taught this text in either language and what has it been like? Now, I can't say that I've taught it. Um, and I don't know if any of you have taught it, but um, even posing that question about how to teach it and in what context to teach it. So I would be really curious if, you know, if, for example, Patrick, if you would, you, if you would use this, um, this text to teach, how would you teach it? Yeah, um, I actually used it together with uh, Judith uh, to build a whole lesson plan around it, oh. uh, or a couple of lesson plans, actually. Uh, in, I'm trying to, to make sure because it's like a, like a whole week endeavor uh, in which our students basically get to know the, the story a little bit, and they... Um, we, we start talking about like uh, something that, that we touched on before, um, this idea of like culture or cultural staples or cultural images in it, um, which I think we, we see very much in the beginning of the story, you know, the, the punctuality of the Regionalbahn, uh, der Sonntagsfahrer, um, and of course, you know, the, the L'Oreal image that, that's in there, uh, which is also very much a German cultural staple. Um, so they learned a little bit about that um, and then it actually turns into a little bit of a translation task uh, mm -hmm. where they uh, pick a paragraph or I think we gave them a paragraph that has a lot of these cultural um, images in it and um, ask them to translate and uh, it's just great to see like all the things that people come up with uh, which also speaks to um, a question that we talked about before is like you know, the many different versions of a translation, like you will always get a different, um, a different translation depending on how many people you ask to translate something. And um, so the idea is also um, that I will then hand them uh, one translation that I actually put into Google Translate uh, okay. and see what, what it did with that and just kind of have them, you know, figure out like who wrote this and what, what did it do with these words, you know? Um, and then, of course, the big reveal, oh, this was Google Translate, we all agreed it was not great, so we should not be using it for our own work, obviously, yeah? <laughs> um, or also to, uh, you know, how to use it effectively and, and um, in, yeah, in, in a way that actually helps us, you know? Uh, so that's something that, that uh, we've been doing, but we also talk about this idea of uh, Sprache as Gefängnis or language as a prison that the, the being talks about mm -hmm. uh, in the second half of the story, um, which is, of course, particularly interesting when, when you, um, you know, this was a class uh, taught in the fourth semester German class, uh, which is like, you know, intermediate, advanced, um, where a lot of students still have this, this feeling of, you know, German as kind of like like a prison because they feel like they don't know a lot about the language yet and they have to again like walking on thin ice maybe like like I do when I translate. Um, so that was also an interesting thing to talk about and to just think about you know language use in general and who gets to use language, who gets to translate things and who's allowed to do these things. That's a lot of square, uh, scare quotes but yeah. I'll yeah. There. Um, there's another question um, that is asking um, Sharon to talk about a little bit more about Ada or Ada and why she chose to focus her upcoming novel on her. She seems to me to be both to be the central character in the short story, even though she's seemingly peripheral. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I had, um, I think when I first started to write about Ada, she was really 
we hadn't seen her yet. I think it's described that she's the cleaning lady and Herr Grutzuk doesn't even know she exists because Ada comes by so early to do the cleaning. He hasn't ever seen her before. And at some point then I wondered about her myself and I thought about what would it be like to write a story where the main character hardly appears in the story. Um, and it fascinates me when people talk about Herr Grotrup Tetsichin that many people will say, oh, it's a story about Herr Grotrup, which I guess from the title you might say it is. But I always think it's a story more about Ada. Um, what was the question again? Why did I decide to focus my novel on her? Um, the second one, yes, the novel, yes. Yeah. Well, it was always clear to me that I was going to do more with that character, that it was, um, it was, it was clear to me that the figure of Ada had a lot of knowledge and a lot of expertise. And if the main characters took their time to talk with her and, you know, get to know her, that they would find out a lot more. They would find out, for example, why it was that the egg was refusing to be hard boiled and such. And because they assumed that she didn't know anything, they didn't, uh, speak to her. So then I wanted to think a bit more about why did she know these things? How does she know them? Um, and there's also references in the story which make it clear that Ada is the one who's sort of the furthest along the path of development, whatever that development is. Um, so yeah, that was fascinating to me. And I had a lot of thoughts about it while I was writing the short story. Very complicated thoughts. And I thought, is it possible to um, explore those? And, and so I've what I've tried to do with the novel is explore the figure of Ada and um, explore why she is the way she is and what she knows and what she means in terms of the lives of other people. It's, I can't really talk, I haven't gotten used to talking about it yet, <laughs> but um, I'm hoping that it will make more sense when everyone's read the book. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a couple more questions. Um, let's see. Oh, lots of questions. Uh, lots. Yes. I'm intrigued by the relationship between Sharon writing in German and Patrick translating into English and the ways in which that seems to resist the idea of translation as somehow an act of domestication. And it raises the question of native speakingness as ownership. Would either of you be willing to comment on that? I saw, I saw Patrick nodding his head. <laughs> uh, well, Sharon, if you want to go first, or, or Katie, you can probably also speak to that. Yeah. I would just very briefly say that this is something we've been talking about in the UK literary translation community, where the position has shifted a little bit over the past decade or so from a very strong insistence that we only translate into our mother tongue to, to recognition that that is um, a little bit too um, restricting. Um, but I have nothing to say about it because that's what I do, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think, you know, actually I had a little bit of a, an identity crisis <laughs> when I got the prize. I was like, what does this mean? Am I a German speaking author now? What does this mean? And I didn't, I didn't know what to, it really stressed me. I have to be honest. Um, and I even called one of my old university lecturers. I was like, what does it mean that I'm writing in German? I'm getting a prize for it. And then I decided that because, you know, I'm a little bit self-conscious about the fact that I'm never going to learn all the nouns with the, you know, the dirty das. It's just, it's just not going to happen in this lifetime. So, when I let go of the angst around that, then I thought, I can be, a, I can be an author, <laughs> you know? And somebody's going to have to correct my daddy das mistakes. But what I can do, which perhaps um, people who speak German as their first language can't do, is I have a particular perspective. Um, I'm, I'm looking at Germany and German life and German culture and German people through this lens of someone who was socialized in the UK. And that brings with it a certain, you know, that's why I noticed certain things that other people may not have noticed. I had the comparison to the UK that a person who's only lived in Germany would not have seen necessarily. So because I bring that, then I also bring um, an ear for picking up an odd word like Yemensch perhaps. Um, and that is, an, is a valid contribution to, to German literature. Yeah, I might not get the comma right, <laughs> but I don't have to. There are 
wonderful people who do lectorate who can do that. Um, but I can bring some energies, some emotions, some feelings and perspectives in. Yeah. Yeah, I feel that your answer actually perfectly mirrors also my experience as a translator, you know, where, um, yeah, I might just go through this and be like, well, maybe this is not the right word, but it's the one that seems, you know, like the best way to put it. Uh, and then, you know, either the author or an editor can still tell me that maybe it's not. Uh, absolutely. And yeah, there is a lot of uh, kind of prescriptivism going around language in general, really. Uh, and yeah. again, like who... who uh, is allowed to translate into what language and do you really like when it almost sounds like there's like a like a particular step or test that, that you take you know until you're allowed to to translate um which i think is just a myth and um you know when it comes down to it translation is also just playing with language and um yeah so um i'm not sure if that answers the question but yeah it's it's a very similar process to maybe um what Jan was just describing. It actually connects to the next question um, in terms of playing with language. Over the years, I've had, I have used a lot of translations into English, both literary and professional. I have often found that American translators use a lot more slang than do British translators, regardless of the tone of the original. Do the translators have, this, have the same experience or any explanation? I mean, I would actually say that American, there, there is a kind of playfulness and informality about American English that makes people inclined to use slang. Um, but I also think that we use, that there is a, there is a huge enormous amount of slang, <laughs> you know, informal conversations. Um, that would be one thing that I, you know, I would say that there is a, a way in which that is the colloquialism of American English, but I don't know what you, how, how you, would you think about that? Patrick, go ahead. Um, that, that's a good question. I would probably have to think about this a little bit more. I, I am inclined to say that, that American English can be a little bit more like aloof. <laughs> like <laughs> but what? I, I, don't think, I don't think that's uh, aloof. aloof, but I don't think that's, that's true across the board at all, because there can also be, be horribly you know, stoic and bureaucratic American English. Um, and, but yeah, it, uh, I would have to think about why translation would maybe, you know, trigger um, a word choice that is more colloquial. Mm. But at the end of the day, I would say it really comes down to the, the source text uh, and who's translating it. Yeah, it's, it's very difficult for me to um, compare because I have spent probably three weeks in total in the United States in my entire life. Um, and one of those times I was seven. So uh, <laughs> uh, what the thing that I do notice is that my editors, when I translated from German, tend to, um, depending on the audience, but usually when I'm translating adult fiction, they tend to uh, beef up the swearing from German to English, so so that um, uh, while German swear words see, seem, I think I've found an equivalent, and my editors will go, <laughs> a gangster's not going to use that word, Katie. <laughs> Just put that F word right in. Oh. Um, um, so, I, I really, I'm such a terrible limited specialist because all I know is translating from from German contemporary writers to to British English, um, and but I would say that not there's not a whole lot of slang in German contemporary writing, or not the kind that gets translated. I think that the, you know, I, what I would say is that the, there's a lot of slang in German in the different dialects and iterations. So there's an enormous amount of slang in Berliner, right? <laughs> in the Berliner dialect, enormous amount. And, and I love it, you know? And there's also an enormous amount of slang in Bayerisch. Um, and so, but like, but that's, it's very sort of yeah. local slangs. Um, so you'd have to be writing locally to use that. And when you would do that, it would be an indication of 
who you were in that particular locality. Um, so that's, that's also really interesting in terms of the back and forth. Um, another question. Um, Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Patrick. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to add something really quick because uh, this was uh, just like a very pivotal thing for, for me to read. There's a, a lovely article by um, Robin Queen, which is called Du hast ja keine Ahnung, African American <laughs> uh, uh, English dubbed into, into German, which basically analyzes how, um, you know, a lot of like African American characters when they're dubbed into German, uh, you know, they're being dubbed with like certain uh, sociolects or regiolects, like they all of a sudden they, you know, use Berliner, um, which is of course all kinds of problematic. Um, so this is just something uh, that's, yeah, worth exploring maybe at another time, but something I just wanted to point out because I think it's just so fascinating, this, uh, <clears throat> this alleged equivalence that there is or like making these connections. Yeah. So here's a wonderful question. It was part of a two-part question. I think that uh, Sharon already answered the first part of it, but if Sharon could briefly discuss her speech at this year's Bachman Prize, that would be great. <laughs> and I would love you to talk about that too. Oh, okay. That's a wide question. <laughs> <laughs> I need it to be narrowed a little bit. Well, what motivated it? What, you know, okay. what was your intention behind it? And yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, it was a great honor and surprise that I was even approached. I was approached, um, I think, at the end of February, I believe, um, and asked if I would like to do this. And I, I said, uh, I have to just go and think about it. <laughs> I had a mini breakdown and then I go, of course, I'd love to do it. But I had no idea what I was going to say. Um, and then, um, of course, beginning of March, everything shut down. And it wasn't even clear if the uh, competition was going to take place at all this year. And that actually, in a weird way, helped me because it just, there was a lot of uh, release of tension then because I thought oh, it might not happen anyway. And so I was able to just think really freely about what I would, what I would say if I had this audience. And it was clear to me that it was a very, very big uh, chance. Um, I wanted to say some things that I thought it was really important that had to be said um, um, and that maybe it would take another 40 years before another person would say them in that context. Um, and it also, when I wrote the speech, it, I wrote it long before because I had to write it because it, and it had to be uh, edited um, and layouted and then published. So it was written long before um, the tragic murder of George Floyd in June. So it was interesting that I'd written this speech and then all of a sudden the context arose that made the speech somehow even more relevant, uh, if that makes sense. Um, and a lot of people wondered if I'd written the speech because of that. But um, I think it was just clear that the, the things that I mentioned in the speech just had to be said. There was, um, what year was that? I think last year, the novel Bruder by Jackie Tome was published, if I'm correct. It was published yeah. rather recently. I think it was last year, yeah. And this year, the novel uh, Thousand Zerpatine Angst from Olivia Wenzel was published. And the reception of these two books a lot of the discussion was circling around, uh, I don't know if I'm being unfair, but to me it arrived at how, how real are these experiences that are being, you know, how autobiographical anyway that always comes up, but also how authentically black are these experiences, you know, and they were sometimes unfairly compared, this is more black than the other, and, and you know, this kind of thing, or Jackie Tome was, um, in some uh, reviews, almost praised because she wasn't writing about um, very violent racist experiences, you know. And I, I, it was a very weird um, atmosphere where I just felt that one of the things I wanted to talk about in that context was we need many, 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 many more black authors writing in the German context and being published and being reviewed, being discussed being promoted. We need uh, many, many more authors who are on these um, authors programs receiving uh, stipendium and such. 
because at the moment we have a situation where this sole black author has got this burden of representation on them, which is just highly unfair. Um, and it shouldn't be up to any one individual author to represent the authentic black German experience. That's a nonsense. So that was one thing that was really important for me to say that this isn't about when, when we're discussing these black German authors, we're not really talking about them. We're talking about what we imagine them to be, what black people are still representing. Who wrote this? Toni Morrison wrote um, in Playing in the Dark about the Africanist, right? This is this mythical black figure. And um, it's like a projection of all what we think about black people or Africans or such. And uh, that's still going on in Germany. And it's highly frustrating because it, it becomes a straight jacket if you want to. If I want to write a story, I find myself censoring myself because I'm thinking, well, if I write that, then everyone's going to think that all black people are like that. If I write this guy in this particular way, everyone's going to think all black men are like that. And that's a real problem which can only be solved if we have many, 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 many more black people involved at all levels of publishing and uh, writing. That was one thing that was really important for me to bring across. Unfortunately, I have the impression that the speech didn't really arrive yet. Um, people who have written about the speech either criticized it um, because they felt that I was preaching, I think. They felt that I was trying to tell um, white Germans that they have to read all these black authors and they have to be on board with politically correct language, which I definitely wasn't. I was saying, this is the way I see it. I invite you to participate in this exchange. That was one thing. Or the other thing was many people were writing about the fact that I had written um, a, a case against racism. So yeah, Sharon wrote an impassioned speech about racism. And again, I found that there was not going far enough. I think I talked about many, many things and um, and I, I wish that, that, you know, I talked about solidarity um, between black communities and Jewish communities. I talked about um, learning myself as a privileged person. I'm able-bodied and how it is, how can I use language when I'm speaking about deaf people and such. So I talked about different things and I feel like it didn't really arrive yet. It wasn't really received in that way. At least the, the things that I read, the reviews that I read on the speech one. I think that, you know, as always, as, as it's often the case that, you know, such a powerful statement is what the one that you made, you know, sometimes people aren't ready for it, but that doesn't mean that you can't make it <laughs> or that it's not timely. I think it was absolutely timely and, you know, thank you. <laughs> Just thank you for making it. Um, you're welcome. I think that that's a really great place to, to wrap up um, because I really feel like the combination of that speech and what Herr Gertrup represents and the critique that you're, that's implicit within it, um, I think those two things are really completely in harmony <laughs> you know? and that they are in synchrony and particularly at this moment in time, I'm very, very grateful to you both for the story and for the for the speech. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, um, Juliana to come back on to if she wants to say some final remarks on behalf of uh, Deutsches Haus and previews for other things. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tina. Thank you, Sharon, Katie, Patrick. Thank you, Brittany. Um, I was just uh, thinking that this uh, might have been the favorite event for me that we've presented this year. And I don't like to say that because of course, as an event organizer, you always say, oh, this is the best event ever. And you know, every event is the best, but, but nobody's listening. So I'm just saying, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just saying this to, to, to you, the participants and the audience members have to think that this is uh, Las Vegas. So everything that happened here stays, stays in the room where it happened. Uh, no, no, seriously, guys, this was wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts, your insights for, for coming up with great uh, uh, guidance and leading the discussion, Tina, and for sharing your thoughts and experience and translation, Katie and Patrick and Sharon, thanks for 
sharing your thoughts about your writing process and your observations of the German language and culture, which of course is also your own uh, uh, language and culture in addition to, to, to your other language. And, and I think this, this conversation has shown that nobody is limited to just one thing. We can all be many things. And if the world had more people like that, I think we wouldn't have debates like we had yesterday. Um, and, and for the next debate, I wish that thus I would be the moderator of the discussion. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be much okay. more fun. And, and I have to say, and this is uh, perhaps oversharing that when I read your story, Sharon, I, I heard Mick Jagger in my head with sympathy for the devil. And <laughs> <laughs> that the, the main character of that song is somehow an elective affinity to Das I. Um, mm -hmm. And this is weit hergeholt, but I just needed to share that. And I've been having Mick Jagger humming in my head since, since I read your wonderfully unsettling story. And I, I recommend your story to everybody. And, and, and not just your story, but the whole publication, which uh, Brittany and Still Magazine, thanks again for making this happen. The illustrations are fabulous. The two translations uh, and the German originally all have a wonderful uh, uh, troika together in this um, really amazing piece of art. Um, okay, that was, that was the Lobeshymne. <laughs> now I'm going to segue brutally into some uh, shameless self-promotion and uh, just mention our next event, <laughs> which feels strange, but I'm just going to mention it because it's going to be good too. It might not be my favorite event ever, but perhaps I'll change my mind by the time we have that event. And uh, no, I won't. But it will be a good event uh, and it will be really worthwhile your attention. So if you have time on October 8th to tune in uh, for a talk by Elisabeth Bronfen, uh, it will be in German though. So you still have about a week's time to learn German if you don't speak it yet to, to, follow that, uh, to follow that talk. And the title in German will be Angesteckt Zeitgemäßes zu Pandemie und Kultur. And here for the translators, angesteckt is of course very interesting because it's both infected and pinned on. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, we can really create that in, in, in one English word, I think, but perhaps this is a dare for you translators out there. Uh, so think about angesteckt. Also put on fire. <laughs> yeah, du hast vollkommen recht. Yeah. yeah, I didn't even think of that. Mm -hmm. Well, we have good people here. Um, anyway, so that's next. Uh, next week, oh my god. And then our next literary, this is just crazy, our next literary event will take place most likely on October 21st, but since we've been so distracted by life and the pandemic and politics, we haven't fully fixed the date, uh, and it will be a conversation with author Peter Wurzman, who is also uh, working in the bilingual field, both in German and English. So that could be an interesting uh, sequel to some of the issues we've uh, raised here and uh, have been provided insight into. So if you have time, maybe on October 21st, uh, tune in and you can check it on our website. Um, and the, the biggest event that's coming up is, of course, on November 3rd. You've probably all seen my necklace, very subtle. Uh, so please make sure to vote if you're an American citizen and, and make something good happen because I need some sleep. So uh, thank you all. This was really fabulous. Uh, have a nice afternoon or a nice evening and uh, hopefully see you all again soon. Thank you.